church. I uh, I was teaching the uh, teens Bible class last <coughs> year at the congregation I attend over in um, I don't know where I live, Pittsburgh. <laughs> and uh, we came upon this verse, First Timothy chapter two, verses twelve through fourteen. And this verse says, "I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, and Eve." And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And we started talking about this particular verse. We also talked about uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 36. It says, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak, speak in church. And when you uh, have teenagers look at those verses, they pretty much gave the same type of answers and statements that most people in the world would say. Uh, these are two verses that the majority of religious groups in the world simply do not agree with. Uh, they believe that women have the right to do whatever a man does. If you ask them, should women be allowed to speak in services? Should they be allowed to pray up here or, or lead a sermon or whatever? They go, sure. What right does a man have to tell a woman that she can or cannot do something? Uh, they believe that a, a woman can do whatever a man can do. And although it, I believe it is possible that women can do whatever men can do, it's not necessarily biblical. I have to admit that some women, if they were to get up here and leave singing, would do a whole lot better job than some of us men do. And I have to admit that if some women were to leave prayers, they would do a whole lot better job than some men would do. But if the Bible tells us in these particular verses that that is not what God wants us to do. That is not the organization of the church. It's not a biblical concept. And uh, before I begin, I want to have a disclaimer. Uh, because at the end of the day, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 36 says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. At the end of the day, no matter how good or bad I am, no matter whether I'm able to convince you or not, whether my arguments are good or bad, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, this is what the Bible says. I am not preaching on the opinions of Eric. I'm preaching on the gospel. So if I cannot convince you that women should not preach, if I cannot convince you that women should not pray, it is not important what I say. It is important what the Bible says. My objective is not to prove this command, but to possibly show reasons as to why this verse is a good thing. And even if I can't do that very well, we have what the Bible says. So I think it's important, and um, when you look at it, passages, you know, there's always going to be passages that you don't necessarily like. There are passages in the Bible that I do not like. For instance, I don't like Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. That passage says, let every soul be subject to the building of authority, for there is no authority except from God, and authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. I love reading about politics. And the more you read about politics, for me, the more you hate this particular passage. Because it just seems unfair that we have to be subjected to people who are, that you do not like. Whether you, they're a Republican or whether they're a Democrat or an Independent, you know, there's always politicians that we think have made really, really stupid decisions. And we don't want to have to be <coughs> to them. We don't want to have to respect them, but we do. Because that's what the Bible tells us to do. So there are passages in the Bible that I don't necessarily like. And some people might say, I don't like the fact that women can't preach, but it doesn't really matter. Because we do what the Bible tells us to do. There's also passages in the Bible that I don't understand. For instance, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I know that. I don't understand how it happens. I can't put it into a test tube. I can't go up to an atheist and try to prove it from whatever. I don't understand it. But I believe it. And when I say I don't understand it, I don't understand how God created the earth. I don't understand how there was nothing. I don't understand how there was a void. But I believe it. And so simply because you don't like something, simply because you don't necessarily understand something, doesn't mean that you don't accept it. So when we look at women in the role in the church, you might not like it. You might think that women should be able to do this, 
But we still, at the end of the day, have to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and say, this is what God told us to do. We may not understand it. We may not understand why women can't get up here and preach. Or why we may not understand why God said, do it this way. But that doesn't mean we don't accept it. And there's some things to remember. And I think this is very important. If you look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's not a male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Sometimes people seem to think that simply because a woman can't preach that she's a lesser Christian. But that's not a true statement. Headship and submission are assigned roles. They're not based on work. It is not that I'm more worthy, I'm up here, and that you're less worthy if you're female, that's why you cannot get up here. Um, but the purpose of all is to do God's will. And this verse says there's neither Jew nor Greek. Jew nor it's what, Greek. There's, there's neither male nor female. When it comes to Christianity, you're a Christian. That's it. But simply because you can't stand up here and preach doesn't mean you're a lesser Christian. Simply because a woman can't get up here and do the Lord's Supper doesn't make her a lesser Christian. The world will say to our youth, you can't preach because they don't respect you. You can't do this because I don't think you're good enough. But that's not a true statement. In the Bible, when it comes to Christianity, there's either Christian or non-Christian. And God has given us specific roles in things that he wants us to do. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death, even the death of the cross. If God, the Word, ultimately the Son, could subject himself to the will of God the Father without diminishing his own deity, can a woman who is created in the image of God subject herself to man without it diminishing her likeness in the image of God? without it being demeaning to her as a person. Which woman here, who was created in the likeness and the image of God, who will never preach a sermon, who will never lead a song with the other men here, which woman here did God not make in his image? So we should never look at a female and consider them to be lesser simply because they can't do things that God has ordained for the men to do. And I think also it's important uh, to remember that the world has a really weird definition of what leader is. And I think sometimes we bring that definition to the congregation. We bring it with us. But if you turn over to Luke chapter 12, you know, Luke chapter 13, we're going to read Luke chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 17. And this is going to tell us what the definition of a leader truly is. Luke 13, 1 through 17. How about John? <laughs> All right, I'm going to do it. John 13, verses 1 through 17. John 13, 1 through 17. It said, Now therefore, when the feast of the Passover, when I, before the feast of the Passover, <coughs> When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to his father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil already had been put into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. 
and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who is sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I think it's important for us to realize the true definition of what a leader is. A leader is not someone who gets up here and forces you to do anything. Jesus gave a perfect example of a leader. A leader is a servant. And I think every man that gets up here needs to realize that they are a servant to the congregation. Whether song leading or praying or doing the Lord's table or preaching, we are servants. And I think when we get up here and we think that we're more than just a servant, when our attitude is, I am a leader, when we come up here with the attitude of, you must listen to me because I am a man that God has put me here, we've missed the entire point. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I have really bad feet. I would not want anyone doing that. But he humbled himself to show us what a true leader is. So if we get up here, and we get up here with the attitude that we're a leader, but not with the attitude also that we are a servant, then we really shouldn't get up here. And too many people think leadership means getting up here just because you have the right to get up here. I don't have the right to get up here. I have the privilege to get up here. I have the honor to get up here because God allowed me. He put me in this role. This is the role that God has given me, and I must live by that role. Because if you remember um, back in Genesis, if we don't fill our roles, then we demean ourselves and we lessen our value. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, the woman said to the servant, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the servant said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God did not put man on earth to be God. God put man on earth for a specific role. He gave man and woman a specific role, but Satan decided to deceive them and try to deceive them and say that, you know, you need to be bigger than where God puts you. God says this is what you should do. But you know what? When you do this, your eyes are going to be open. And you're going to be bigger than what God wants you to be. We need to realize that our role should be exactly what God wants us to be. He told Eve that she could be like God. And now he tells women that they can be just like men. God created man and God created woman, and he placed us where he wanted us to be. It is not our right to question that decision. When God created woman, he created a unique being for a specific role. And we may not like it, we may not understand it, but God knows more than we do. And we must live with it. We must accept it. Um, I think God made women, and I'm going to say something that's, that's going to sound wrong to me, it may sound wrong to you, uh, but I think that godly women are more important than the preacher who gets up here to preach. I think godly women are more important than the song leaders who get up here to win songs. I think godly women are more important than the men who get up here to do the Lord's Supper because godly women are extremely valuable to the health and the vitality of the church. Being a Christian, doing what God wants you to do, doesn't just end in on Sunday and Wednesday. Being a Christian is something we do constantly, every single day. There are a lot of things we need to do outside this building, and I think there are more things we need to do outside this building as Christians than we need to do inside this building as Christians. And women, God has given the privilege of helping to do those things on the outside as well as some things on the inside. Good, holy, and godly women are the very backbone of many congregations. If you take away the godly women of a congregation, I believe that personally it would be devastating. I think it would be more devastating than if you took away the preacher. I think it would be more devastating than if you took away the song leader or the, 
even the elders, because godly women, before we walk into this door, before you get into this building, godly women were given a responsibility by God to raise up the young so they can be ready to do God's will. And that happens before we get here. The responsibilities of women that affects worship. Uh, women start the process of children becoming Christians. And I think it'd be foolish if we were to start believing in our head that godly woman, that what a godly woman does outside doesn't relate or have any bearing to what happens on the inside. If you look at um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, says, this is uh, Paul talking. He says, when I call her, remember the genuine faith that is in you, which first grew up in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is also well, in you also. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Paul recognizes that it was women in Timothy's life that helped him become the man he became. He had a genuine faith. Timothy had a genuine faith. Because he saw that genuine faith in his mother, and he saw that genuine faith in his grandmother. It's the women in most congregations and most families that teaches the kids songs about God, that teaches them to love God, that starts the very foundation of raising those kids into Christians one day. Also, in Titus chapter 2, verse 3 through 4, that's not just something that stops when, once they're older. It says, um, in Titus 2, 3, 4, it says, Old women, Older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. I mean, look at this verse. What are some of the responsibilities of the women? That they're obedient, that they're chaste, that they're homemakers, that they're good. What kind... What kind of congregation would the men be leaders of if there were no godly women? What kind of congregation would the men be leaders of if the women in the congregation neglected their role? Their non-preaching, non-singing, non-table doing role. Because some people believe that if women can't do that, they're not leaders. If they can't preach, they're not leaders. If they can't do this, they can't, they're not. But what kind of congregation would, would we have if we didn't have those godly women who, before we even get here, are teaching the youth, who are being good, who are being homemakers, and all those things. church too depends upon godly women. Um, if you look, if you think about it, if there are no godly women, there are no deacons. Fact of life. You cannot have a deacon without a godly woman. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 to 12, it says, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not giving them much wine, not greedy for money, hold the mystery of the faith of the pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons be found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be husbands of one wife, rule their children in their own houses as well. If we did not have godly women, we would not have deacons. And interestingly enough, if you did not have godly women, you would also not have any elders. Because it says, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint, appoint elders in every city as I have commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of this, this yeah, or insubordination. Um, now, what's interesting and something we don't actually think about because we're always talking about we need good elders, we need good deacons, we need good Christian women because without that, you will not have elders, you will not have deacons. And what's interesting is in both, in order to be an elder or a deacon, you have to have the rule of their children. And most of us know who's at home raising the kids. Who's at home teaching them God's will? Who's at home teaching them the Bible songs? It is the women. And I had a crazy thought. 
bear with me. Take every person, every male in the Old Testament that you ever like respected, every male that you think this is a godly male. Take uh, Daniel or David when he was doing good, or Solomon when he was doing good, Elijah, Elisha. Take every great male from the Old Testament. And then take every great male from the New Testament. Take Matthew and Mark and Barnabas and every person that you look at and go, wow, Peter and Paul, these are great males. And take them all and build a little building right there and just put them in the congregation. You would think that would be like the ultimate congregation, right? That would be a great co congregation. You've got Paul and you've got Peter and you've got Elijah. That would be an awesome congregation. But you know what's interesting about that congregation? Without godly women, that congregation would never be able to reach the place where God wants to be. Without godly women, there would be no elders in that congregation. Without godly women, there would be no deacons in that congregation. So when people say that women are not respected, they have no clue what they're saying. Because without godly women, you can take every perfect man <coughs> in the Old Testament and put them in a congregation, and that congregation would not be where God wants it to be. Because without godly men, without godly women, that congregation would be lacking. It would be inadequate. The church can never reach the leadership and position that God <coughs> wants it to be if we don't have godly women. And it's important that the women not only accept that, but they have to embrace it, and they have to teach it. And they have to say, this is the role God has for me. I might not preach. I might not do lead singing, but I am the foundation, the backbone of that congregation. And I'm just as important as that preacher. And I'm just as important as that elder. And I'm just as important. We should never allow ourselves to diminish the women of our congregation. We should never allow the world to tell us that they're not good enough, that we don't respect them. Because when you respect a godly woman, you respect God's authority. You respect the congregation. And you respect the fact that God knows more than we do. Um, and sometimes the very membership of the church depends upon godly women. Uh, women can help bring men and women to the gospel. In Acts chapter 18, it says a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructing the way of the Lord and being birthed in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. To begin to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Priscilla was a female. It took me a long time to realize that. But women can help bring members to the congregation. And not only that, uh, women through their submission can bring their husbands back to Christ. Uh, Peter, first, chapter 3, verse 1 through 2 says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Earlier I said something weird about how women are more important than preachers and elders. If a man falls away and he refuses to come to the congregation, and he refuses to let the men come talk to him. Who's going to get him here? It's going to be his wife. It's going to be his wife with her chaste conduct. It's going to be her wife. His wife is going to be teaching him by her actions. Women are so important. And they're so important. Which, which man in this congregation can bring back a fallen brother who refuses to see him by preaching a sermon, a relating a song. Because they're not here. But God still allows the godly woman to have that role, that role to bring her husband back by her actions, by the things she does. Um, and it just happens full of women who strip the men in the church. Uh, we, we have Phoebe. We know that in uh, Romans chapter 16, Paul commend Phoebe, who is a servant of the church. Um, also, um, the women at the tomb of, of Jesus. Um, and it's interesting, we're not going to read that, but if, if you think about it, who was the first to proclaim that Christ had risen from the dead? Which is what our whole belief is based upon, a part of what our whole belief is based upon. It was the women. 
It was the women who went to their tomb. It was the women who then went back and says, we've seen Jesus risen. They were the first. Um, and there are plenty of other things. Um, it's interesting. And I did this little thing in my head. You know, people say that we don't respect women and they're not really important. But I started thinking, what if you were to take the women away from the New Testament? Just take them out. Because it's a man's book. And I realized um, Jesus was born of a virgin. So you pretty much would have to stop right there. So that shows the importance of women. Because were it not for women, we wouldn't be able to be Christians, right? Because it was a woman that had Christ. It was a woman that raised him. And of course, we get rid of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And um, a lot of the books in the Acts, a lot of things in the Acts talk about women, godly women. Uh, for instance, it, it talks about uh, Lydia. So if, if we're not for Lydia, we'd have to get rid of Philippians, obviously. And we talked early about uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother. So if you remove them from the Bible, we wouldn't have 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy. They would be gone. Uh, you'd have to get rid of every passage that dealt with elders, because every passage that deals with elders talks about godly women. You'd have to get rid of every passage that deals with deacons. And so when you start removing women from the Bible, you're left with a shell of the Bible. Women are so important. And just because they don't get up here does not lessen them. Because God has a role for them. And there's one other thing. But what's important, at the end of the day, if you love God, you'll seek to please him by doing what he's commanded. At the end of the day, this is our command. God has said, this is what I want you to do, and therefore I will do it. Um, we may not understand it. We may not agree with it. But at the end of the day, it's what God wants us to do. And if we truly believe that our Savior loves us and wants what's best for us, then we're truly going to believe that he's going to tell us what we need. It may not be what we want, but what we need. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 36 says, Let you women keep silent in the churches, for not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. Now, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husband at home, home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. This is the God, this is the word of God. God is ordained that women do not have a public role in the congregation. And if we truly love God, and if we truly believe that he only does what's good for us, then we're going to follow his, we're going to allow faith to control our thoughts. We're going to allow faith to control our actions. We're going to allow faith to control our beliefs when it comes to this verse. Leadership in worship is not something to glory in. It's an opportunity to hum humbly serve as God has designed for each of us to serve. I think the hard thing for us is to put aside what we may think works best in favor of what God has revealed. Because what God has revealed always will work best. So may God keep our hearts and our minds aligned with his will and with his purpose. <clears throat> Let's start with number 28. Number 28, that'd be an invitation song. <clears throat> Next time he comes, he'll talk about how uh, the Bible explains the women they need to obey, but it tells the men that they must love their wives. For some reason, men don't understand that. And uh, the Bible tells us multiple times how we must love our wives, as Christ loved the church and be willing to give his life for her. And the only passage you missed was, if you don't take good care of your wife, your prayers will be hindered. So that seems something important, that, that men need to honor and love their wives. So if you would, at this time, if there's any reason you need to respond, any reason you need to respond to the gospel call, please come forward as we stand and sing number 28. Number 28. <clears throat>